Hi, Carla. Good morning, and we are live. This is Mark Henderson Leary trying to figure out how to go live without a producer, but it seems to be working. And I'm here with my good friend Brad Fryer. How are you this morning, Brad? Man, I'm, I'm proud of you. You got it going. <laughs> you know, I uh, there was a moment where I was like, you know, this is going to be the shortest one ever because it's not going to go live. It's not going to work. But Mark Henderson Leary came through in grand fashion and proved me wrong. Yeah, we I put the wrong splash date splash screen. It was last week's date. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so if you see that date and yeah. you think that you're on the wrong week, it's not you. It's us. Yeah. Well, so um, how are you? How are you? How are you doing today? I'm good. Good. Yeah, man. Just got back from vacation yesterday, and um, so today is reentry, which is always a little bit painful. Um, yeah. And I've got a. Uh, a week that is just so jam packed that I am I am paying the penance of uh, a vacation. Well, two things. Uh, I like we can t- I can unpack that, uh, but also Carla, Carla and I were in absolute agreement that we think you as on vacation guy is like the the permanent thing. We should do that because it looked great. It sounded great. Your internet connection was the best it's ever been. <laughs> Your sound quality amazing? was like you were really? outside on a dock, and it was better than when you're in the office. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know what? If we can figure out a way to make that work, I'm in. I'm <laughs> right. in. I, we'll go to work uh, on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you you had the 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 pulse of we you took a vacation. Did you clean house uh, metaphorically well enough before you went out uh, to make sure? I did. Yeah. I mean, I really, the week before vacation, I worked hard to remove almost everything that I could off of, off of the plate and let everybody know where I was going to be and that I was, you know, really going to try to disconnect. And, and I really did. Um, every morning, my, uh, my, my brother's family was in from California. And so uh, he and I would sit out on the pier um, around sunrise and uh, have our laptops open and get, get a few things knocked out uh, while the family was still sleeping. And so yeah, you know, we tinkered a little bit, but we didn't really. It wasn't wasn't a whole lot of hard work. Just just to kind of keep the inbox cleaned out and okay. respond to things that were pressing. So this week is coming at you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, I I, uh, I always struggle with vacations. Um, you know, disconnecting and and then that that catch up. Uh, I think I think we live in a an environment where most people aren't good at vacations. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. they don't take long stints. They feel like there's always has to be some sense of connectivity. Um, and with technology today, you know, um, coworkers, bosses, customers, prospects, I mean, everybody expects you to respond. And, you know, there's this sense of, oh, you're going to be gone for a week. And, and I didn't experience that much, but, you know, thankfully, but, um, but yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of people have a difficult time vacationing because the the um, the connectivity and I don't know I don't know if it's the American culture of vacation, but you know it, it uh, aside from you know students who are look at you tinkering I can tinkering. see you messing with this great. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you, know, you hear about some of the European countries and, and what a what an amazing job they do of just shutting down and letting people go and reconnect yeah. and get their brain right. Uh, but uh, and, and maybe I just do it wrong. I don't know. But I, a lot of folks yeah. that I know I struggle with vacation. And uh, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So here's something that I've learned indirectly from. Um, I'm not in the strategic coach program, uh, but I've I have many friends who are, and they use this thing that he's created called. I believe it's the entrepreneurial time system. And the concept of it is figuring out how many days you're going to work focused in flow and making and doing your craft, how many days you're going to maintain your business and stuff that's not really flowy, but you got to do. And they call those buffer days. And then there is this concept of free days, which is a day where you don't work at all. And you, you do this, the life stuff, the weekends, the vacation and things like that. And, you, and he's really serious about you not uh, mixing Mm-hmm. And part of the concept is when you map the year out and you realize exactly how few work days you've got left once you take the time you need for yourself, um, the, the, um, 
the criticality of that time goes up and you start saying, all right, well, I've only got 50 days in the next you know, period you know, and I got to make it count. And so it, it forces you to really get more out of the work days and get more out of the, the free days as well, where you're really, really relaxing or re recharging is a better word and yeah. uh, enjoying life and being present with your family. And I have really begun to see how true that is when, when I really map out how many days and if I'm not, because if I'm not careful, I just start ex assuming there's more and more time than there actually is to get the work yeah. done. And so it's really forced me to say no a lot more often. Is it like, you know, I can't take all these meetings with people with good ideas. I got to really only take meetings and focus time. And these 30 minute meetings, they need to be 15 minute meetings. And these 30 minute meetings, they're actually more important. Than that. They need to be 90 minute meetings. It's really forced me to really look at, at the recipe for the year. It's a great point. Yeah. So, so do they do that? And this sounds like a great topic for today. Do they do that at, as an annual exercise to say, Hey, map out your year or do they say you know, break it down into quarter or month or how do they, how do they approach that? Because uh, I mean, yeah, like for uh, me, I'm a bad, I'm a bad, I'm a bad planner. Right. Yeah. And so I don't do a great job of, of putting vacations on the calendar. There, there's one mm -hmm. or two a year that I'm definitively taking, you know, there's going to be spring break and there's going to be one, one extended summer trip. And then there's, you know, likely there's a couple other littered in, but I'm not a, I'm not a good planner. So mm -hmm. what about folks like me who aren't a good planner? How do you make that happen? Well, as I'm, I'm not, a, I'm a terrible planner too. Uh, and it has a lot to do with some of the commitment that goes with that. And like, if I'm going to block that out, what decisions do I have to make now? And, and I sort of reject some of that. Uh, but it is it is largely an, an annual exercise, and you and you jump jump in at some point. And you say like, all right, let's plan the whole year out now, and it's imprecise. You say like, well, how many vacation days or free days is his term? Because you don't necessarily have to be on vacation; you just have to not be working. And so they can be in town, they can be out of town, they can be whatever. But it, it, whatever it is, it's pulling yourself a hundred percent intentionally out of all that work stuff. Yeah, and I and I've really started to learn why that becomes very valuable. But you do that annually, and then you kind of per, you move into it. You you go on a quarterly, monthly basis. You sort of track the days, and and it's a really it's somewhat complex exercise because if you said you wanted a hundred days of um, or or hundred and fifty days, and you do the math on how many weekends there are, and that's you know. 52 weeks is 104 days right there on weekends. So, okay. So if I'm going to take a vacation, what does that do to the number? Is it, do I want to take once a month, a Friday off? I mean, how do, how does the, that formula start to play out? And mm -hmm. you get yourself in, in two interesting spots. What's your regular pulse in terms of I, I every, every, you know, once a month or a couple times a month, I take a, take a Friday. And that's, that's adds to the equation as opposed to, I want to take three weeks in the summer or six weeks in the summer, which I know a lot of people I know, they'll block a whole summer, a whole month off and they'll take it off and they'll put that into their formula, which then allows you to kind of do the math elsewhere. All right. That means I got to work these days and then I got to get, I got to really make hay during that winter time because those are my days because I'm not going to get mm -hmm. them back. They're going to be gone during the summer. Yeah. Well, and then also how do you, how do you queue up the, the being absent for a month, right? What are the things that you have to have in place? What are the processes, procedures, sure. accountability? You know, you know, someone's got to cover the desk or make sure that depending upon what your job function and what your role is, right? Like in sales, if you're in sales and you take a month off at some point that that time away from prospecting or lead generation, it's going to catch up with you. And mm -hmm. so how do you, how do you make up for, for lost, momentum or however you would look at that. And then granted, well, most people don't take a month off. So that might be the, the extreme example, but even just uh, say a, a, a 10 day vacation or two weeks. I think that's uh, the, but uh, the, one of the questions, why don't more people take a month off? And there are some, some obvious reasons the, the boss that says, F no, <laughs> you're not going anywhere. Not while you're the junior account rep or whatever. Um, but it, there's a discipline yeah. that that we do teach in the EOS system that Gino brought into the system. There's five leadership abilities. Or I say brought into this. He he calls out to to consistently break through the ceiling of your business and life. You need to do five things really well. And I'll quickly hit them. But that, there's one I want to call out specifically: simplify, uh, pr simplify, delegate, predict, systemize, and structure. And and simplify is less is more. Delegate is bringing other people into the 
business into the structure, into the vision so they can carry their part and you can do your best part, your best part. Predict long-term and short-term, which I'm gonna unpack. Uh, systemize is making it easy enough to work there to kind of set up systems so the predictable stuff happens automatically so you get your time and energy back for the hard stuff. And then um, structure, that's making sure you organize things so it's logical, simple, efficient, and, and that's worth unpacking at some point as well. But the prediction is one of the ones that continues to kind of surprise me that uh, prediction is about goal setting, the 90 days and beyond, long-term long -term, um, prediction is 90 days and beyond. You know, where are we going? Why does this matter? Um, you know, vision type of work, uh, long-term goals, 90 day rocks, that kind of thing. Short-term prediction is the expectation that you're going to try to do that on a, like I say, a 90 day pulse and things are going to work against you and new ideas are going to come up and you're going to have to drive some consistency. And so you have different modes of execution. So it ends up kind of being strategy and execution fitting together. All that to say, I get so surprised when something so simple of prediction, like take a minute and predict well this sounds very esoteric like well okay let's just look forward into the future like what's going to happen in the next 90 days oh i'm going to be on vacation okay what do you need to know about that <laughs> you get to plan. Okay. <laughs> like what, what's that vacation going to be like oh i don't know i hadn't thought about it all right we'll take a minute now how long is that going to last okay what what day are you leaving Okay, somebody gonna need to know something on that day? Is there gonna be, you're gonna save some money between now and then? You're gonna maybe cut back some expenses here? Um, that's prediction. <laughs> you know, If you're gonna take a vacation and you want it to be a month long vacation, when do you plan, when do you start doing the work for that? Uh, not the day before you go. <laughs> So the prediction concept is simple and exceedingly powerful in such mundane ways. Like what's, what, just take a minute. <laughs> what do you need to know? What has to happen? What do you need to do to be ready to be out for a month or even a week? Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. So where do you, where do you think the biggest disconnect is? The, um, on the predict is it because people don't invest the time is it because they don't know how is it because they're intimidated by the future and the, the fear of making a mistake over committing or well i think there's a, there's a few factors and it, one is anything uncertain is hard Mm -hmm. uh, and and I and that's why salespeople make the money they make, and because they're they're paid proportionately to the amount of chaos they're, they're able to turn into structure. So uncertainty is there is a salesperson's business to make something totally un uncertain, very certain, and not only certain, monetized, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> turn it into money. And so that's why sports players are paid so much. It's it's a high it's a competition. The the game outcome outcome is in, totally uncertain, and they're and when they win, when they make it certain, they get paid big money. So all human beings are much more comfortable by default in something that's predictable. A salesperson loves a PowerPoint presentation. They hit next, 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 as opposed to. Well, why why would you do this deal? I'm confused. It sounds like this isn't something you would want to buy. Why are we here at the table? That's the opposite of certainty. And that sales rep, sales rep one is account manager making predictable, not that great money. Account sales rep two who asks the hard questions, challenges. That guy has access to unlimited earnings because he's willing to embrace the chaos. So I went way deep on that, but yeah. the idea is well, basically. And that was a great. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and that was a great example of strip lining and negative reverse selling too. Uh, you know, yeah. Why, why would you? Do? Somebody that was a little sidebar. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. And so that's why those tools are so powerful and so scary, right? You have a hard time teaching that so stuff the uncertainty, because, yeah, yeah. So uncertainty yeah. that's 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 a lot less interesting than something which is certain. And one thing that's very certain is the tyranny of the urgent like your inbox, like I need that quote today. And so the time just goes away. So if you don't protect prediction time in any form, whether it be clarity breaks or strategic planning or anything where you just take the time to do some prediction, it's just easier to say, you know, yeah, I was going to do something slightly uncertain, but you know, I will go get you that cup of coffee. I will go get that quote out there. I will requote that thing. I will call so-and-so back who called me five minutes ago who wasn't expecting. That's what, that's what happens. The tyranny of urgency. I have no. I don't know that I've ever heard that before. Well, I'm just a treasure trove of things you've never seen before. Right? <laughs> you are a national treasure, Mark Henderson Leary. I am quite um, national. <laughs> so, 
So the tyranny of, of urgency. So, uh, so let's unwrap that for a second, because, mm-hmm. you know, all of this, the, the, you know, prediction, planning the future, trying to, to create a, a roadmap for the year ahead so that you know how to best use your time so that when you realize how finite your time is, you put more focus, more attention, more urgency to it. So the tyranny of urgency, that that's when you wake up in the morning, you open your inbox and you have 50 new emails in your inbox from overnight. And there's this sense that, oh my God, I've got to get this cleared out before I can do all the other things that are going to build towards whatever, because right. it's, it's that, that pressure cooker pushing down on you. Is that Exactly right. I mean, it's, 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 it's there's no filter, right? So when I work with a leadership team, one of the first things I start teaching them is putting things on the issues list. And that is to say, we're going to park it and assess it at the right time with the right budget, the right mindset. And so we're doing the foundational work to get clear on where we're going. And once we know where we're going and we have some clarity, say we've got our rock set or end all the long-term stuff, we have a filter now to say like, where's an issues list over here? What's the issues list? All of the opportunities, obstacles, ideas, good and bad, right? So an issue is, it could be a problem. It could be a, a cool thing, you know, and those mm-hmm. are, and, if, and that list is going to be somewhere between 10 and 210 items. But when you get really good at it, it's closer to 210. And now we know we can't solve all 210 at once. So what do we do? They yeah. got to have that filter. So we got to have the prediction, the long-term prediction that says, for where are we going? Because I'm about to fish some issues out of this long list and I'm only going to pick a few. And so if I just start at the top, instead of filtering, who knows what I'm working on? And my energy and my time is, is busy, but it doesn't move me toward those major goals. Like for example, if I wanted to have a month off, I have to do some pretty specific work to make that possible. And if I just do whatever, I'm going to get to that spot and I'm going to have to cancel that vacation because the stuff's not, not in place. It needs to be there. Right. Right. So when you look at the, the, was it the, urgent and important versus, you know, not urgent versus, you know, I mean, do you, do you work with your clients through that, that grid of, uh, of urgent and important versus urgent and not important versus not so urgent and important? I almost important always refer, I say, who's read, you know, seven habits of highly effective people and it's usually half the room these days as people are getting younger, less and less people know the book, but many people know uh, yeah, quadrant sure. two. I say, what's quadrant two? And there's somebody in the room says, oh, that's that stuff I'm supposed to do that I don't do. And so... <laughs> Uh, and essentially quadrant two is that stuff that is, uh, important, but not nagging. Like it won't happen on its own. You got to decide to do it, but if you do do it, good things will come from it. And so planting the seeds for the future. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and the, the work I'm usually guiding them through is how would you know a quadrant two item, which the whole, the seven habits book is phenomenal about doing that kind of stuff. It's giving you some tools to paint your personal long-term goal, but quadrant two is highly subjective and quadrant quadrant one is actually, which is the urgent stuff is also highly subjective, but it's subjective by other people. And they've decided that it's important and usually, and you're just usually kind of following along and following other people's visions and other people's goals. And so it takes your decision out of the process. But quadrant two is hard because there's a million great things. Things. Like you can pick up all kinds of books, you can watch TV and get all these great ideas of stuff that looks amazingly impactful for somebody's goals, for somebody's outcomes. Mm-hmm. And so you got to do the work to know, all right, what what's actually important to me? What life do I want to live? What What is my business going to be about? And if you can do that, the important stuff in quadrant two surfaces at the top. And you might have 10 things, 100 things in that bucket. And so you're going to have to say, what's the one? two or three maybe that I can start working on now. So what do you think are some of the bigger things that, that salespeople and leaders have in quadrant two, which are the, the important, but not necessarily urgent, meaning, you know, they're important to your business. You know, they're important to your future success, but it doesn't have to be done this moment because it's not on a stopwatch. So what are some of the things that fall into that bucket that you see people, your clients or people that, you know, um, missing out on or not not doing um the most god that was a long god i I could not have framed that question any worse um 
Well, I could have. I'm good at that. I'm I'm, I'm known at the five-minute question, which is so much backstory and five questions wrapped into each other that's a totally unanswerable question. So I get that feedback on the podcast all the time. Okay. So so a couple of things that that come up for me. One is, I don't even, this this may not even be the answer to your question, but the the most powerful two quadrant things, powerful quadrant two things are learning how to say no and, and having a plan for no, which is, that's not my ideal client. And th- this, this person, you know, finding how to get that bandwidth back. We're, we're chasing the deal that's in front of us, not getting that time back to chase the very best deals. And so mm-hmm. that could flow back into uh, sort of the other one, which is that prediction. Um, observing oneself. At, do I have the filters in place? What am I doing? Is it working? Do I know enough about why I'm doing this? So I think every, I believe and I teach and Gino taught me that uh, one of the most important leadership attributes is taking that clarity break every week, typically to say, to ask that question, what am I doing? And is it working? And do I need to make changes? And that's kind of the space where you get into who is my best client? Like I've got 20 I'm working with, but like if it were only 10, who would the 10 best be? And if I were working with the 10 best, what would I do with that extra time? I would find 12 of these great clients and how much more profitable would they be? And how much easier would it be for me to get out of the office on time? And how much more fun would it be when the phone rings? Because these people are people I like as opposed to people who are in front of me right now. All right. So I'm going to, so that was kind of a conceptual answer. Mm Mm-hmm. Give me a, give me some tactical answers. Give me some, give me some things that people should be doing to invest in the long play, but don't because the, the, the tyranny of urgency, um, overtakes. So as a, yeah. So a leader like myself, as a leader or a, yeah, leader well, or a salesperson. First of all, I did mention the clarity break. That might sound conceptual. It's exceedingly tactical. Block the okay. damn clarity break. Take 90 minutes or longer with no distractions, no electronics, and get the, pe- the, the paper out and the pen and let those ideas come forth. Get, get okay. your, out yeah, of your like patterns, that. get out of your patterns, get out of your habits, and give yourself, and if you've never done this, like if you sit in front of your pad of paper for the first 15 minutes and there's nothing there, then sit there until something comes out because you are totally wired into your email. And you as a leader need to actually be creative. And that's how you do it, getting yourself unplugged from the matrix. And I cannot... Um, stress that enough and the people that i teach who really embrace this come back with their minds blown of how impactful this is so that is real um the second thing salespeople this isn't as easy so i'll speak really to entrepreneurial leaders get out of the damn email just get out of it um you know you're not a customer service rep uh, I, I get that, that Steve Jobs had a unique approach, to, and, and I can't really speak to his tactics because he was known to occasionally respond to customer service requests, and that was exceedingly valuable for him gaining customer perspective. So that's a different topic, being being really able to be in the mind of your buyer. But uh, And so there's a middle ground problem that is – uh, the tyranny, tyranny of the urgent. Get an assistant. Have somebody manage your inbox. Get yourself, you know, let somebody else tell you where you're supposed to be uh, because that that inbox is so transactional. And it just, it, if you can do the Steve, uh, the Tim Ferriss method of twice a day, that's a great start. If you're not sure what that is, get, uh, get the four-hour work week and, and learn how to do Tim Ferriss's approach to twice a day email. That's phenomenal. Uh, or get out of it entirely. I've, got, I've gotten almost entirely out of my inbox. I don't, I check right. it maybe once every couple of days uh, and I have, and so I'm the things that I need to respond to are they, they find their way to me and that's been yeah. a total game changer for me. Yeah. Well, and, and so uh, the other things that come to mind are things like coaching, right? Do we, are we investing time in our people? You know, do we, do we, do we take the time to talk to our team to talk about where they are, what are they working on, help them improve and grow, right? That's one of those things that quickly becomes, um, wiped off the calendar when we get busy oh we don't have time for this you know we're just just keep doing what you're doing keep up the good work uh you know for salespeople, prospecting you know that's the thing well i don't have time to prospect because i'm i have all these meetings and all these conversations and all these proposals to write and all these fires to put out um you know strategic planning um accountability you know the, all these things that that they don't solve an immediate problem and so they they end up you know getting kicked down the road whereas if we did them more regularly we probably wouldn't have as many urgent problems 
because we would be proactively preventing the forest fires rather than running around putting out fires. Um, and so those are, those are some of the things that I think about in quadrant two that, that, uh, that, that people tend to conceptually, they know they need to do it, but they don't understand how it's going to help them today. And so they, they figure they have time to get to that, but it's that it's building that culture, the habit and the routine of, of doing those things that are going to make you a better leader, a better salesperson or a better organization six, 12, 18 months from now. We tend not to look that far out. We tend to be concerned. You know, it's the, it's the, the visual that I've always had is if, if I'm driving a car, where am I looking while I'm driving? You know, you're, you're typically looking at the horizon. You're looking up ahead. You're looking at stoplights. You're looking at warning signs. You're looking at uh, exit signs, right? All the stuff that's up ahead. You don't drive your car by looking at the front edge of the hood, looking at just what's right in front of you. And a lot of us live our lives that way, we sell that way, and we lead that way. We lead by looking at the front edge of the hood, right? What's right in front of me that's going to be a problem versus keeping our eyes up on the horizon. And, you know, oh, you know what? There's, there's a, my exit is in two miles and I'm on the inside lane. I need to go ahead and start merging right. Um, you know, and so those are some of the things that, that as leaders, we have to keep in perspective. So there's a near and far. I'm going to add a little, I love what you said, and I would add a little dimension to that. And that is yeah, in the long-term and short-term prediction. So the pulse, the 90-day pulse, that's really, are we going the right direction, which is sort of beyond the horizon. It's beyond the horizon. Okay. If you do Fair. that well, if you over do that, is it over the hill? Is it, if you, yeah. you do that well, you can say like, well, what kind of things are we going to encounter along the road? Which when we plan for that, can give us some peace when we're back in the flow because we're going to take a, a full day the teams i work with take a full day to do the quarterly planning and then you go back into it monday morning and now you're kind of like your eyes are on the road and you're and you're trying to make ground if you're if your eyes over the just to, over the tip of the hood because you don't know what's a, what you're about to experience we didn't really look at the car that well we don't know if this car can handle the road uh that's a lack of long-term prediction in that sense but if we hit the road we got plenty of gas. We got four wheel drive. We're good to go. Now you can, your eyes can move up towards the horizon. And now we can say, uh, let's, let's, let's execute. We have a plan. We don't have to worry about what's over the hill. We did that planning. We don't have to worry about running out of gas. We did that planning. And so now we can drive efficiently, efficiently and effectively. And when something does come across the road, we can just plug into that. We can say like, there's a pothole. There's a, there's an armadillo. <laughs> and like, I'm not worried about the armadillo. We're in a, We're in the right vehicle for squishing armadillo armadillos. <laughs> so, uh, I do, I do this think show there does is not a, condone squishing armadillos. <laughs> Yeah, well. <laughs> for all you armadillo <laughs> lovers out there. Uh, all right. Uh, well, I tell you that that is a that is a great adder to that because that you that that does encapsulate it all. Um, in the in the minute and a half that we have left, I'm not going to um, close this out because I keep closing this out in in a minute and three quarters. So you're going to have to do right. it, man. So so here's here's my takeaways from today. Number one is you know have some have some visibility into the over overall plan of what your year is going to look like for you, right? Make sure that you're carving out time for yourself and, and, and being deliberate about how and when you're going to take that time off so that you can more, more acutely manage the time that you're going to be investing in work and, and understand the, the importance to the time that you have. Um, but then also, as we work towards the future, be aware of those quadrant two items, right? Not only are we don't allow yourself to become a victim to the tyranny of urgency, right? You know, Focus on that quadrant to, in addition to what you're doing today, but think about what are the seeds that you're planting for tomorrow. Um, I think that I think that brings it home, and it gives us 60 seconds for you to say goodbye, Mark. Well, I will do that. I will add one thing, though. You you implied this. <laughs> you implied this that if you don't know where to start on that, get some help. Find a coach. Call somebody. Uh, yeah. Get somebody. Impl implement a system of some kind because it's a lot to sort of get sort of sort through. Use a system. Get some help to do exactly what Brad described, and uh, you know, you won't regret it. I promise. Uh, and if you don't like your coach, then fire him and find a new one. <laughs> so because if you do it right, it's amazing. That's it for today. We will see you next week. Thank you so much, Brad. Be good. Have a good week. Bye. <laughs>